I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today, we'll be speaking with a leading advocate of the separation of state and church, the Reverend Barry Lynn. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Does the U.S. Constitution demand a separation between religion and government? Our guest today says yes. Barry W. Lynn was the executive director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State for 25 years. For decades, he was on the front lines of litigation and all over the national media as an eloquent, staunch advocate for religious freedom. Ordained as a United Church of Christ minister, he's a prominent leader of the religious left in the United States. Barry Lynn has won the Roosevelt Medal of Freedom He's the author of the books Piety and Politics, The Right-Wing Assault on Religious Freedom, and God and Government, 25 Years of Fighting for Equality, Secularism, and Freedom of Conscience. Barry Lynn's new book is a memoir, a trilogy, actually. It's called Paid to Piss People Off. What a great title. It traces the major periods of his life in three alliterative volumes, Peace, Porn and Prayer. The back of the book says, Barry Lynn has caused lots of good trouble. And that's the kind of trouble we like. I love the title of your new book, Paid to Piss People Off, Barry Lynn. Welcome to Free Thought Matters. It's so nice to be back. And nice, nice to see you again. Nice yeah. to see you again. So you retired as executive director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State back in about 2017, is that right? What's it been like being a private citizen again? It's been fun, although I must say that uh, after a, a significant uh, retirement party in Washington, three weeks later, I nearly died. Huh. And I, uh, because I, I was visiting my now deceased mother-in-law, I couldn't get out of bed one morning when we were visiting her. We were in a motel. I said to my wife, who is a physician, I said, I just don't feel good. I want to go home. But because she's smarter than I am and a doctor, she said, no, we've got to go to an emergency room. So I went to an emergency room and um, nearly died from a heart condition that had actually kept me out of the army. Well, I failed my army physical because of this condition. And 45 years later, it caught up with me. I spoke to the American Atheist Convention when I got out of multiple hospital stays, and I said, the one thing you should never do, never retire and then have a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. You can't do really justice to either one. And uh, But I did say to them, I always loved talking to atheist groups, um, I said, you know, you people say, oh, when you have a near-death experience, you see friends, you see a tunnel of white light, and then there are relatives. And I said, I didn't see any of those things. So to that extent, uh, you can't justify uh, claims to a life hereafter mm. on the basis of that. And, and said a by a reverend. <laughs> That's by a reverend. It was kind of a, a surprising and 
unexpected and unappealing way to spend a couple of months in hospitals. Well, we are certainly glad that you have recovered. Glad that your retirement, have... your retirement lasted <laughs> longer than three weeks. <laughs> yes, it did. It did. But, uh, but, you know, it's very important. I still keep up very much on these issues and all the issues that I care about. And it gives me more time to do that, but it also it makes it difficult. I really miss going out and meeting people who care deeply about the separation of church and state. I used to be on the road three, four days a week. I'd go from, once I went from Maine to Iowa over, over uh, the course of a day. And I miss those because there are so many decent people, theists and non-theists, who care very much about separating church and state. And this is the worst time in my life for the possibility of actually having a theocracy, a government run along narrow religious lines, become instituted in the United States. We have the prospect of the first declared Christian nationalist as Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who used to work for this extremist group that I'm sure Freedom From Religion Foundation on I know Americans United, we, we, we were litigating with them, arguing with them on radio and television constantly. And here is a guy who was one of their chief litigators and who now, upon becoming the Speaker of the House, announces that um, God has selected leaders, including, I guess, himself. And then he goes and prays right on the floor of the house. When Sean Hannity interviews him a day later, Hannity says, well, what do people need to know about your worldview? He said, well, go get your Bible off the shelf and read it, and then you'll know where I stand on everything. Exactly. I feel, I feel exactly the same yeah. way. I'm sure Dan does. I've never been more worried about the dangers of theocracy and Christian nationalism. So we're with you. People have been yeah. taking their Bibles off the shelf for centuries, and look what that's done for us, the <laughs> different interpretations. And so, yeah, so Barry, we, 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 I really like your memoir. I mean, it's, it's up close and it's personal, and you talk about a lot of the things you just mentioned. And it's a, it's a three-volume memoir uh, published by Blue Cedar Press. Is that right? Correct. And it's uh, uh, and there's there's three three volumes, but uh, we want to talk about bro volume three, which is prayer, which aligns with the work that we do. Sure. Uh, but first, tell us briefly what what do you cover in books one and two? You know, I was very active in uh, opposition to the Vietnam War, and then had an opportunity because I was in a position and moved to Washington to be able to work for Amnesty for War Resisters, um, and uh, and then to try diligently to stop the draft registration from coming back. And that failed, actually. Draft registration is something every 18-year-old man needs to do to this day. There was constant discussion about how many people would be prosecuted for failing to register. 18 people were prosecuted, 17 of which actually sent a note to the Justice Department say, here I am, my name is such and such, I live at such and such, and I'm not going to register. And one guy was a Laotian uh, refugee and probably didn't even know he was supposed to register. Nobody else. So this one of the many things that we shouldn't do is we shouldn't have laws on the books that we're not going to enforce. Why in the world should we do this, posing the possibility of it being implemented as a criminal act, a, a criminal matter, when, you, when you're not going to seriously enforce it at all? So you also, I guess, worked with the ACLU on many issues too, right? Absolutely. Some church-state issues and a lot of censorship issues. And I, I think probably the thing most people remember me from, from the ACLU, is defeating the Ed Meese Pornography Commission. Yeah, that's right. They, they set it up. It was clear from the beginning that they weren't going to look at whether there were any dangers. They did identify this as a pornography is a major problem in America. And, um, and they tried in their own foolish way uh, 
to do that. And ironically, there were four women out of the 11, and, and three of them uh, objected to the conclusions and said that they, they made no sense, that they, they were not based on anything scientific. So it was kind of a joke. And, and the, the cover of the second book on porn has a picture of Ed Meese, the attorney general, accepting the report of the Pornography Commission. And he accepted it right under the statue of the goddess of justice in the great hall of the Justice Department. The Justice Department's goddess has one breast exposed. And I don't I don't say this because I'm proud of it, but I always refer to that picture as the two boobs photograph. <laughs> what are you gonna do? So you uh, are a United Church of Christ minister who headed correct. a state church group for a quarter of a century. Did that create culture shock, as, as you called your own DC radio show? And how, <laughs> how did that work for and against the cause? I mean, I think it, it worked well for the cause. I mean, I, I have some somewhat traditional Christian beliefs, but a lot of my objection is not just to uh, religion attempting to take over government, but also by some of the strange arguments that are being made in the name of Christianity, some of which are being made, you know, were made by Donald Trump, but some of which are just made on a regular basis by by people who, let me just give you one example. Uh, people go, God is all knowing. Well, if you read the Bible, you just go to the f book of Genesis. He creates the world. He creates two people, Adam and Eve. They're in the Garden of Eden, but then he can't find them. Hmm. He, just, he can't locate them. There are so many profoundly silly ideas about what a divine presence ought to mean. And unfortunately, when you take those views, add them to the cultural views of the religious right, as so-called Christian nationalists now, you have a recipe for complete and utter disaster. Complete here, here. culture shock. Amen. Uh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So well, we, if I get convinced, Dan, we'd have a, we'd have a, a complete agreement here. Well, he used to be a minister. <laughs> yes, I know that. I so, know that. so as a minister, I'm sure you believe in prayer. Why should prayer be kept out of government? For two reasons. Number one, um, it is unconstitutional, and I think clearly so for government to start to get into the prayer business, whether it's writing a prayer, selecting a prayer, having students somehow uh, decide to give a prayer at a football game, all of these things, most of which have been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court when it was a bit healthier and more understanding than it is today. But the other thing is they screw everything up. Government has a tendency to screw everything up. If you really care about prayer, the last people you want praying for you are government officials hmm. who probably don't understand much of anything or, in the case of our former president, takes the Bible and holds it upside down while he's giving a <laughs> speech about it. So I don't trust it. There are very few members of Congress that I ever met who really understood even the faith in which they were a part, Christianity. And I'll tell you, there are, there's a tendency on the part of some Christians to say, well, what we need to do is go to Congress, and when they start talking about gay issues, we, we're going to combat them with our understanding of the Bible. And I remember there's a very prominent gay rights activist. He came to my office. He said, we want to train people to argue from the Bible about gay rights. And I said, but no, you don't want to do that. We're not having Bible quoting contests on the floor of the House and Senate in order to make decisions about policy in the United States. It doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right. The Bible, you can care about it. You can revere it. You can like parts of it. Understand that it's not a science book. It's not a history book. It has limitations. But don't try to make policy 
on the left or the right based on your understanding of the Bible. That's right. Or any other holy scripture. Based on the Constitution. That's right. It's a pretty good document. It's lasted a long time and, you know, possibly will last a little bit longer. Let's hope. We are talking with Reverend Barry Lynn about his memoir, Paid to Piss People Off. And when we come back, we want to talk about some of the people you pissed off <laughs> and, and also what you call the big issues with separation of state and church. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Jarvis and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation. I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should eat crackers and wine on a Sunday or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct. And they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute when no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace. Let's restore respect for America's secular roots, help the Freedom From Religion Foundation defend the wall of separation between state and church. Join us at FFRF.org. Freedom depends on freethinkers. We're back with the Reverend Barry Lynn, who headed Americans United for Separation of Church and State for 25 years. We're talking about his new memoir, Paid to Piss People Off. Barry, chapter six of your book is called The Big Issues. Let me just list them because we probably can't get to all of them today. They are creationism, Ten Commandments, public prayer, National Day of Prayer, faith-based initiative, project fair play, and public schools. We'd certainly agree with you that these issues dominate our time here at FFRF. Can you talk more about these big issues and your work on them? Let's start with creationism. This is the thing I worry about the most with this current Supreme Court. The corruption of the federal judiciary is nearly complete. Most cases don't get to the Supreme Court. As you know, they, they stop at the appeals court level and it's been corrupted. Most of the federal circuits, there's where most of these decisions are made, Republicans don't nominate the best people to the Supreme Court or for that matter to federal courts. And Democrats, frankly, don't do enough 
to try to stop it. One of the frustrations with dealing with Congress is that Democrats go home early. They do not stay. They do not hang around in order to fight. Amy Coney Barrett should never be on the Supreme Court. But the Democrats during that period, brief period before uh, they voted, they could have done all kinds of things. They could have objected to uh, proceeding under what's called unanimous consent. For example, in the beginning of a Senate day, they asked for unanimous consent to dispose of the reading of the congressional record. And everybody, nobody wants to hear it, but it takes up time. Can you imagine the amount of time that would have been wasted listening to somebody read the congressional record? Democrats, oh, we don't wanna do that. It won't look good. You know, you have to have a certain number, a quorum of people in the Senate, one more than 50. Quorum calls, I used to use them a lot when we had, you know, responsible, even occasionally, separation of church and state advocates who were Republicans. And they would go to the floor and they would demand the, a quorum. Then they'd have to send a sergeant at arms out to find the senators and bring them back. And as soon as one of them would leave, They'd suggest the absence of a quorum again. These are hard things, and do they do really piss people off. Huh. But if, if you elect somebody to public office who allegedly stands for certain progressive values, including the separation of church and state, but they're not willing to go to the mat for it, what is the value of having them there in the first place? Creationism bothers me. Two major cases went to the United States Supreme Court. In both cases, um, the court said whatever the state, Louisiana, in both of those cases was doing was unconstitutional. It can't prohibit the discussion of human evolution. You can't have alternatives to evolution taught. And Americans United did a major case in Dover, Pennsylvania, where they decided to have students go to the library and read a book. But the book happened to have been donated by the local church. And it was a creationist book. But if that went to the court again, could we believe that this current mix of six ultra conservatives and, you know, two and a half more progressive people, would they not say, well, you know, it's a speech. It's, it's a speech. Let's hear it again. I don't want another case about creationism to get to the court. The courts have been corrupted. And if they're corrupted, you can't risk taking cases there uh, and potentially setting us back even further. But the judge in the Dover case was a conservative Republican Christian who did the right thing. Are yep. you saying there's not enough of those judges around anymore? No, they're not enough. And I know Judge uh, Jones, who's now actually the president of the college I went to, Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. And I've talked to him since and uh, many times, and he didn't like the lies that were being told in his courtroom by the people attempting to defend creationism. And that ticked him off. And I think he then went on to be one of the first federal judges uh, to approve of same-sex marriage. Mm. He'll be getting a Clarence Darrow statuette from us at a Centennial Convention we're going to have next year to honor the Scopes trial of Centennial. And he's agreed really? to speak. Yes, and I'm, I'm so Terrific. excited about that. That's great. Now, he is, he is a man who learned a great deal. He was nominated by one of the worst members of the Senate in Senate history, my Senate history at least, and that was Rick Santorum of Pennsylvania, and a strong advocate for, among other things that you mentioned, the faith-based initiative. The idea that you can give money directly to churches or to church schools and that that's okay, George Bush started it, Barack Obama continued it, and Joe Biden is still, still has an office of faith-based initiatives. Yes, he does. And we sued over that, you know, yep. <laughs> Barry, yeah. uh, Hein versus but, FFRF. But it, it was so distressing. It's terrible. And if you listen to 
the oral arguments, which you can, you know, often do, um, you know, is this the best we got in the legal profession? I know a, a hundred people, a hundred lawyers in Washington who have, are just as bright, who don't have the baggage and who do see things in what I consider, um, you know, the, uh, one of my favorite, uh, lawyers and former solicitor general is now a law dean out in California. He, he said, some people say we need to find a, a living constitution. And then conservatives go, well, we don't want a living constitution. And he says, uh, what do we want? A dead one? A dead constitution is nothing. I think you can go back and look at the values that undergird the principles in the Constitution and say, those are really good ideas. We should stick to them. That's what you should look, not go back and try to figure out what somebody 200 years ago thought about, frankly, about a lot of issues that weren't even around then. Yeah, like you know, treating, the, treating the Constitution as if it's a Bible that we have to interpret literally, you know. <laughs> I do have a sermon, I, I only give it selectively, but it's called Why Bible Literalism and Constitutional Originalism Are the Two Worst Ways to Make Policy in the United States. Well, that sounds okay. like a wonderful sermon. We only have a minute left. Okay. You, you've represented Americans United for Separation of Church and State for years. What do you say quickly to someone who says there is no separation of church and state in the Constitution. Yeah, you say, well, you know something, there's nothing about that says there's a fair trial in the Constitution. And they go, oh, no, but it's obvious that we have to have fair trials. And I say, it's just as obvious that we need to keep a decent distance between the institutions of government and those of religion, anybody's religion. That's what I'd start. And occasionally, you know, you can even change people's minds. Thank you so much, Reverend Barry Lynn for all of your work to keep religion out of government and for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Both of you have been doing a tremendous work. I wouldn't say the Lord's work. <laughs> I would say the best work to make sure that we keep this decent distance between government and religions. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.